uh, going to be specifically talking about, um, let me do the share. Oh, man, you guys are all ahead of the curve. So um, this is what we're going to be talking about, the myth, what I call the myth of the normal you. Um, and I'm going to be leaning on Anne. So Anne, thumbs up or thumbs down. Is there any blob on your screen or does it look okay? Look okay? Perfect. Okay. If there, that comes up, just let me know. Um, but um, the, what Sibley was talking about was um, uh, after the uh, pandemic hit, uh, this had to go in a different direction. And so um, I'm at this point an entirely digital um, training and therapy center. Um, it will, once the apocalypse is over, uh, we will put it in person. It'll probably be in uh, where I grew up in uh, here in uh, Lubbock and East Lubbock. Uh, probably in that, that will, or, or like Arnett Betts, and that's kind of where I bounced around. Um, I mean, so, some people know this, some people don't. I'm actually from Lubbock. I'm from um, East Lubbock specifically. Um, so especially those of you from, from an older generation or those of you who know are from Lubbock or this area and have family who lived here in 93 through 97, if you have property damage during that time, give me a form. I can now reimburse you. I'm sorry. I real, feel real bad about it. It was all my fault. So I'm really sorry about that. Um, so I'll reimburse you. Um, and so uh, the name of the center is the Adversity and Resilience Community Center, the ARC, um, and to, for the short term. Um, what uh, Sibley was talking about is the National Child Traumatic Stress Network um, is a lot of kind of the tools we've been using since the pandemic. And um, all of these are free, by the way. Um, and so we're going to be talking about the myth of the normal you. And I'm putting that in quotes intentionally. We'll talk about why. Um, this is basically how to keep your sanity during this pandemic. That's really the, the focal point for tonight. So this is the three things we're going to be looking at. Um, so action steps on, uh, for tactics, understanding why the tactics works, an example of what you can do specifically. Also, get it? You're, you know, the snapping turtles, you're lazy, you're not, you're ruining my life, I hate you. Get it? Get it. Alice gets it. Yeah, she gets it. Okay, cool. Um, so see, the little turtles, the little an angry little turtle. This is, uh, this is us in quarantine, by the way, right? Uh, so if you bit somebody's head off in quarantine, you're not alone, okay? Um, just like, why are you breathing that way? If you've done that, you're normal and you're fine, okay? Um, if you uh, thought about killing the person who lives with you and the only thing that stopped you was an episode of CSI, like, man, they're thorough on that show and they're so thorough, then you're still normal and you're a good person, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, so. Ominously, I'm going to start with this, March 13th. I thought the best way to kind of go through this uh, talk was with actually what I did as a, as a mental health professional, as a therapist who works with trauma and with stress disorder. So I thought that would probably be the best framework. So March 13th, everybody had um, a it got real moment during the pandemic. We all had one. Uh, mine was March 4th, uh, 2020. I was driving to Oklahoma. Sorry, I'm sorry, as, as for a training. As I, I'm not I'm only going bad. It's not a football thing. Um, football season's over anyway in March. Um, but, and um, my two colleagues, uh, Dan Hoover from Kennedy Krieger in Baltimore, Peter D'Amico from New York. Peter D'Amico was our trauma, child trauma therapist in 9-11. He's our 9-11 trauma therapist. Um, they were coming to do a training in Oklahoma City. Dan, Dr. Hoover's in the air. Pete calls me and my mentor, Susan. I'm on, I'm on 27, about to get, get into Amarillo. And Peter's apologizing, saying, I, I'm sorry. North, uh, he works for Northwell Health, which is the hospital subsidiary for Columbia University. And he has a wonderful relationship with Northwell Health. He said, my boss called me and said, if you get on that plane, you're going to be fired. And he's like, what is going on? He's like, there's a coronavirus tsunami about to hit New York City, which as we know is what happened. And so I, that was my I got real moment. So um, I'm driving home trying to get people to kind of believe something's happening. And so lesson one, um, I, I used to think like, cause I work in the field of child abuse and we hear a lot like, well, this doesn't happen in our community. It actually happens quite a bit. And that, that doesn't make us a bad community. Um, it happens a lot everywhere, by the way. And so I thought that that we're a good community this doesn't happen here was a Lubbock thing. I was totally wrong. It's an everything. Like, and people, the only, I couldn't get health professionals. I, I can get, you know, Joe Blow off the street, you know, saying like, hey, now nah, we're fine. You're overreacting. That makes sense to me. But doctors, medical doctors were not believing like, well, Lubbock will never get coronavirus. I actually heard that from 
medical doctors <laughs> and I can only get one person to take me seriously. And I think that's kind of the most, uh, as simple as that sounds, I think that's one of the strongest lessons I learned, which is, um, you know, just admitting like, yeah, I think I'm doing pretty bad. I think just being able to say that is actually massive amounts of progress. Um, the, um, I, I know none of you have this in your family. I have a lot of relatives who drink. And um, if I can get my cousin to say, hey, I'm drunk, we are going to be okay that night. Uh, because I know I, I can drive. I'm, I'm okay. I can drive. I'm good, man. Give me the keys. I got to trick him uh, <laughs> to get the keys out of his hands. Because what if he's like, no, dude, I'm hammered. Like, it's that kind of thing. If you're like, I'm, I'm a train wreck right now. I'm not doing good. You're about 50% of the way there. You're going to be okay. You really will. Um, now, some of the, uh, these are some immediate things. So uh, the question I get asked a lot is, well, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm holding stability. So what do I do with other people? And I'll actually put this in the chat box um, uh, for everybody if they need it. Um, and it's, um, especially I'm, I'm kind of looking at Anne's direction and some of those folks. If you work in a professional capacity in any way, I, I don't mean a therapist. You're a pastor, you do Sunday school, um, you're an OT, that's the word right there. Um, you um, were, you know, anything, especially in churches. One of the reasons I talk to churches is uh, in faith-based organizations and things of that nature is um, people in those organizations and in those communities have such a strong reach that it's unparalleled literally any other system I work in. Hospitals don't have that reach. Schools don't have that reach. Mental health definitely doesn't have that reach. Red Cross doesn't have that reach. Like, especially in this region of the United States, where do people go to when they're in trouble? Church. Period, right? <laughs> and so that's where you go. That's not just here, but it's it's really kind of like if, if you're not talking to people in, in faith-based organizations, you're really missing a, a great opportunity. So I, I get like, how do I stay sane? But a, a, a question I get a lot is, look, I, you know, how, how do I help this person? It, it's harder for me to see suffering than to have suffering. Is the point. And I think that applies to most of us. Um, so I think most of us would pick. So like, you know, Mike, do you want Claudia to suffer or you? Mike's going to pick Mike. Uh, it's like, oh, I'll take the hit. Um, it, well, I, I think of Claudia's like saying, yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. She's like, yeah, Mike will pick me. <laughs> and so, cause it's you know, seeing other people suffer is harder. And so the, the tools that, and uh, the first one, psychological first aid, we call it PFA, is an app. And you can download it on your phone, your iPad, and it gives you language, um, like literal language. So you can go to the app, type in core actions and safety and comfort. How do I assist an, uh, an unaccompanied child? Okay, so on the app, okay, get down to their eye level so you're not intimidating, okay? Identify yourself. Hi, my name is Anne and establish rapport. Attend the basic needs. Do you, do you need food? Do you need water? Is, are you hurting? Ask identifying information. Okay, what's your name? What's your parents' name? And you just start going down the boxes. That's it. Um, the other one, SPR, was made for uh, actually scenarios like this, like COVID-19, where you have a longer runway. It's not, uh, psychological first aid was made for things like school shootings, could treat like the hurricanes that are coming, tornadoes. Um, I, I worked those in Oklahoma, two F5s in two weeks. Um, don't know, hopefully no one's ever been in an F5, um, but it, it looks like God's wrath. It looks hor horrifyingly scary. Uh, and, so, um, and so PFA was made for that. SPR, Skills for Psychological Recovery, was made for longer things, things that don't really end. We actually used it in Katrina because it, it really didn't end. Katrina didn't really stop once the hurricane left. There was a lot of damage there. So those are uh, tools that I advise everyone to use. And to kind of um, give you an idea of what it looks like, Dr. David Trotter and Family Medicine used this for his talking points for the media back in March. And a sense of hope. We talk about hope being contagious, just like fear is contagious. Um, Kelly Wilson, one of our other trainers, said, um, took out the term socially distancing and replaced it with physical distancing. So we want you to be physically distant, but not spiritually distant or emotionally distant or relationally distant. And as simple as that sounds, that's really important. Sense of calm, -er. so be on a scale of one to 10, being stressed at a six is way better than 10. 
And uh, like, you're not going to get it down to a one during the pandemic. And then the sense of safety. So especially those of you who work with like kids or, you know, things like that, focus just on the facts. Like the, the Dr. Fauci doing the Daily Show was a, a master course in how to do that. Um, so like, for example, Trevor Noah asked him, can we get coronavirus from a package in the mail? No. That was it. That was just that. He's like, no, that's not what you got to worry about. It's person to person. That's what we got. And it was very clear, very, you know, and it, it was, you just really, just, but he was focusing on facts. Um, and uh, the West Texas version of number five is a can-do attitude. So Dr. Trotter got this question, again, from Karen McKay. I, I'm not saying anything bad about Karen. I, Karen was just like asking the question she should be asking as a reporter. And she said, what if we can't do any of these? And, and that's a, a legitimate question for a reporter as Dr. Trotter was very slick and he said, not, not slick in a bad way, but just he, he really understood these principles. And he said, well, Karen, what if we can? What if we can extend hope? What if we can connect with others without being physically connecting? What if we can uh, to communicate to, to ourselves and others that we're common? And what does that say about us as West Texans? How, how does that show how, like our kind of grit as West Texans? Um, and I thought it was, it was a brilliant answer to that. Now, one of the things I, I talk with about, um, like how people ask me, well, how did the kids respond? A lot of people are usually worried about kids. And the kids responded similar to the way adults responded. And it was a 50-50 split. So I'll use Janie and Billy. And basically, Janie was, she said her exact words were, the world is dreary. Like, yeah, it is. So she wasn't doing great. Things were dreary. She wasn't having panic attacks. She wasn't suicidal. Things were just dreary. I said, yeah, that's about right. And like in psychological first aid, we would say, just validate that. Yeah, that's true. We're not gonna, we're not gonna try to fix anything. You can't, and that's okay. Um, I know people are familiar with Brene Brown. I know Anne is and a couple of others are, but um, she has this brilliant, it's like a two minute like cartoon on YouTube and it's about empathy. And she says, empathetic statements never start with, well, at least. Um, so if Alice was talking like, Michael, we're really worried about our finances. Well, at least you have your husband, Alice. Hey, <laughs> um, I've just been really stressed out and isolated since March. Well, at least you have your health. Alice is going to smack me and she should. <laughs> so the, it doesn't start that way. It's like, you're in a hole and I'm above it saying, well, Claudia, at you know, at least you have your family. That's not the point Claudia is trying to make. So Brene Brown says, empathy is going down in that hole and saying, I don't know what it's like to be you right now, Mary. It sounds awful. And I'm just so glad that you feel this. And she has a, a really pithy statement that um, like what helps in the situations where there's nothing you can do are not solutions, it's connection. Connecting to another person. That's by the way, the way our neurology works. I would argue way our soul works, but it's definitely the way our neurology works. Our neurology is made to connect with other primates. It's also, and you have dogs. That's why when you pick up your dog, you feel better. That's really the reason is because you're, you're made to connect with mammals. Um, and if you pick up your cat, you don't feel anything because cats are made out of pure evil. And that's just the fact of the universe. They're just all bad and evil. And dogs are just better than cats. And that's just a scientific fact. Okay. So we'll move on for that. Um, and so, but empathy versus sympathy is connection versus solutions is a lot of things we talked about is how like, and, and I'm, by the way, I'm a guy, I'm a West Texas Mexican guy. I do not think that way. <laughs> that's not how I'm wired. Like fix it. All right. Mike, me and you go out and fix the shed. Let's go. That's how I'm wired. I'm wired as a West Texan guy. So this is really hard for me. And so, uh, because I want to fix it. And if you can, then fix it. But when they're, when you've tried to fix it a couple of times, you're like, there's really nothing. I can't fix a coronavirus, man. Then we go to connection. So I'm not saying don't fix it. I'm saying try that. But if you can't, then go to connection. I'd say you, you have that always, but I mean, you know, from my, the way I grew up and, and think I, I, that's the decision tree is like, well, okay. like, so if Ann asked me for food, I'm going to go give her some food. I'll drop off some food at her house. Uh, but I'm like, how does it feel to be hungry, Ann? No, don't do that. That's dumb. <laughs> like, so no, yeah, yeah you're asking me for food, Ann? I'm going to give you food. Um, but I also got to check because I know I do this too much is check. Okay, Ann, I'll drop off something. How are you doing, Ann? How are things going? And if I get any inkling, it's like, well, Honestly, Michael, not great. Then I'm, I can do both, by the way. You can fix and connect. That took me six years of graduate school. 
okay, I'm a doctor, I'm smart, right? Uh, that's how long it took me to figure that out. Like, so you mean I can have feelings? It's like, yeah, I was like, wow, it's blowing my mind right now. I didn't even know I could have those as a guy. I didn't know, like, it took a while. I, it took me to figure that out. Um, and so connection is really important for this, especially in this pandemic. Uh, now the other kid, Billy, is, um, he, uh, so but when I got back from March 13th was the first day I could devote to the pandemic. Uh, the next, uh, this is like March 16th, and Miss Sandra at our center says, um, I say, hey, I got, I'm so busy today putting everybody onto shelter in place and work from home. I, I can call about half my kids. Can you take the other half? And Sandra's like, absolutely. Can I call Billy? I was like, sure. Why Billy? background is Billy came in for um, trauma therapy. He um, lost a parent and he had a lot of PTSD and traumatic grief. He did very well. The other thing is though, Billy's brain was, he was just born with an anxious brain. He's born to be anxious. I mean, that's just how his brain's wired. Um, Mary, by the way, there's evil right next to you. Be very careful. Okay. Be very, very careful. Uh, and so Billy's just an anxious person and he always will be. And so we're doing a treatment, which we're kind of going to dovetail, this dovetails into that I tell Miss Sandra like I'll bet you money Billy's totally fine and she's like how do you know I was like, I was like no I don't want to bet you because I always lose I was like, okay and so you call them I'll call so after lunch about 2 p.m. I check in with her I said how's Billy she's like how did you know he was fine because she's like he's born anxious he must be a train wreck I was like here's how I know this is the maximum amount that the human physiology and neurology can feel of anxiety this is the max 100 percent Billy is here at all times he doesn't have a lot. So if you're here, you have a far way to go, right? He's here, not that far. The other reason is Billy's brain is wired to see the world as dangerous, harmful, and it could potentially hurt him and those he loves. That's what it looks like. He's like, this is what his brain, this is what it looks like for him? I'm like, yeah. It's like, this is awful. Yeah. <laughs> like, but Billy's a good son. He's a cool musician. He's a good student. He has friends. He has re Billy's fine. You can be really anxious, but also a good husband, a good wife, a good friend, a good spouse, a good, you know, yeah, you can still, those don't exclude each other. And a lot of times we think they do. Well, if I'm depressed, I'm not a good, no, there's no rule. It says that anywhere, right? And so, but we think it is. It's kind of an assumption we put in there. And so I'm like, yeah, and it, it, sure enough, he was fine. And his grandma was even sort of like, how is he? She's like, yeah, I'm, I, I know he's going to be fine. Because he has rejected the idea of the healthy you. He's rejected that myth. So let's actually go to that. Um, and so oops, let me go back to share screen. There we go. So this is what we mean by the myth of the healthy you. Um, there's, uh, in, in technical terms, we, we're not going to go into that, by the way. We, we have second wave and third wave treatment. Second wave are what I'm trained in, which is CBT. Third waves are different. That's what we were doing with Billy. We did a second wave, then we did a third wave. And uh, what can sneak into second wave treatments is healthy you. So, for example, there is the depressed Anne, and then there's the healthy Anne. We just got to get her here. Boom. We're done. Mission accomplished. Anne may be one of the individuals in the world that that does work for. That may actually work for her. But there's a chunk of people, statistically as high as 40% of our population, that that will not work for. The technical term is treatment non-responders. That's a very technical term for meaning. I tried therapy, effective therapy, and I'm still anxious. Or another way is, I am 55. I've had depression since 14. I don't think this is getting fixed anytime soon. And you're right. For me to tell you, oh, we'll get rid of your depression is just a lie. And so the reason that uh, we call it the myth of the healthy you is that essentially that healthy you is at the best case scenario an abstraction. So if uh, like, so for example, if I said it right, actually right about now, sun's going down, I said, hey, uh, Mike, we're going to go towards the sun. Mike understands I'm going that we're going a western direction. He knows we're not walking to the center of the sun. That's just assumed. That I'm, I'm giving him an abstraction like the sun setting, sun sets west. So I say we're going towards the sun means we're walking west. That's the best case scenario for that healthy you, normal you. Here's the worst case scenario is you can't reach it. You think you're literally trying to walk towards the sun. So, because let's say Anne is, is just been depressed since 14 and she's managing it. She's not hurting herself or anyone, but she's depressed. She has depression. 
and she's had it for decades. She's not, depressed people don't do this. Stressed people do not do this. Well, Michael, you're an idiot, so obviously you don't know what you're doing. They go, well, Michael, I think, has my best interests in hearts. Right? I mean, you should all over yourself during the pandemic. You should on yourself all the time. I should have done this, and I should have called them, and I should have been here, and I should have done that, and I should have, right? You beat the crap out of yourself. And that's the worst case scenario is it, it exponentially makes it worse. It, it multiplies it by about 15. Your stress amplifies because you're trying to get to a healthy you, a normal you. And so we just reject that. <clears throat> there is no healthy you, there's just you, and that is great. There's just Craig, there's Marilla, there's just Mary, there's just, and that's all you need. Um, so when, when I started doing this, uh, Anne may have heard the story before, this kind of work on stress disorders, on burnout, on, you know, things about like how to, um, you know, get kind of through stuff like a pandemic, like this kind of stuff, chronic stress is what we would call what we're in now. Um, the people who taught me, I don't know if you've ever met someone who actually has all their stuff together. Yeah, that's who was giving the lecture. I'm not that person. Uh, like, I'm just not. I'm a Denver omelet, but I know where everything's at. And so I didn't, I couldn't relate to them. I'm like, yeah, I, so there was, um, I think Anne may have been, or somebody may have been in his talk, but um, there was a physician from uh, Mass General Hospital, Harvard affiliate in Boston, her name, I her name Dr. B. And she's talked from a very personal perspective about how burned out she was as a resident and suicidal. It's a very personal, beautiful story. And I respect this woman, both as a professional, as a scientist, and as a human being, I, I respect her deeply. And I said that before I got up because I followed her in this conference. And the, here's the reason I said that was because I'm like, I, it's, it's going to sound like I'm about to just, you know, just rain on everything she said. And here's the reason. She was talking about burnout for students. There was OT students, speech students, nursing students, medicine. And her recommendation at the end was, you know, do some self-care. Just take care of yourself. Okay? Claudia, just take care of yourself. And, um, and her record, like eight hours of sleep a night, three balanced diet, four times a week cardio, take your vacation. And the, the, the questions were some variation of this, like Dr. B, we are with you. This is a problem. We are stressed and we need to address our stress. I am an OT second year student. I get five hours of sleep a night. I eat ramen. I, I can't do what you do. I'm not like a Harvard physician, dude. And she didn't have a satisfying response to that. And so when I get up, I say, I agree with Dr. B, but I'm a football guy. I love football. So what she's talking about, eight hours of sleep, you know, three meals square a day, four times a week cardio. That's the field goes. That's a hundred yard line. We're on the second yard line. Um, and this was a, actually a Friday when this conference happened. So I said, today's Friday, yesterday, Thursday. Uh, I drank a fifth of bourbon. I got five hours of sleep a night and somehow I ate only chili dogs. I don't know how you eat chili dogs for breakfast, but I did it. And so <laughs> I don't do that. So I, I'm not there. I'm not anywhere close to the red zone in this, man. And so, but today I will not drink bourbon. I will eat something that's not a chili dog and then try to get six hours of sleep. So keep moving, keep gaining yardage. If you have that healthy you in your head, you're going to be like, well, we got to cover 98 yards today. And it's going to just make you more sure you're going to lose yardage, right? Uh, I don't know if anyone like plays sports or athletics or something, uh, but that's what like one of my coaches would be like, just focus on the, the next down. That's it. Sometimes the next yard. And that's the philosophy is, and the way I phrase it for, for the people I work with and work with me, I say, uh, your goal in life, perhaps your only goal in life is this, suck a little less every day. That's it. That's all you got to do. You don't have to, you know, meditate every day. You don't have to like eat a balanced diet every day. You don't have to sleep eight hours a day. Just like suck slightly less every day. So if you slept four hours last night, try to get five. Okay. If you yelled at your spouse, say I'm sorry. Cook them breakfast. <laughs> like if you were edgy all day yesterday, just own it the next day. Like, hey, sweetie, um, I was a bear yesterday. I'm sorry. That's it. Tiny, 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 tiny things, right? Um, and that's all you got to do every single day. Now, the, the other part of this talk, what I want to do is kind of give you some actual tools, like what are some actual tools you can use? Um, and so there's one set of tools that, that are quick to learn and usually really effective. So I'm going to go over that. But I wanted to pause real quick to see 
any of that um, just sound like gibberish? And it might have. And if so, just let me know. Um, or any comments or thoughts on that, folks? All right. So let's go. Do, do, do. There we go. And back to here. Okay. So um, there's a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. I would uh, rename it Why Squirrels Don't Have Panic Attacks. If you ever see a squirrel outside, just look right now. They look like they need Xanax. They look like they need a, a like Valium. They're like, what's going on? They look like they're about to stroke out every squirrel you've ever seen. But they don't get panic attacks. They don't have migraines. They don't have ulcers. They don't like, that's weird. So Dr. Sapolsky is a, um, a biologist at Harvard. And um, he immediately rolls out diet because we feed bears junk in national parks and they don't have ulcers, right? And so the, the, the short answer is the reason zebras don't get ulcers, what we do is because of this giant frontal lobe we have right here at the front of your head. It makes it really hard for us to process stress because we see stress not as a lion chasing us. We see stress as like there's a pandemic, right? Um, your, your cat, by the way, um, Mary, does not know that there's a pandemic. They really don't. And so it doesn't stress them out. They just don't process it like the rest of us. They know what disease is, but they just, once they get it, but they don't know, like they, so they don't process it like us. They're not worried about catching coronavirus. Um, and that's just how their brain works. Uh, ours works a lot different. So one, this scale is kind of, we, I use my kids, we call it a stress scale. It's a really good one, but it's missing something. Uh, the first thing it's missing is this sensation. Um, so, um, a, a lot, the first thing I'll, I'll tell people is you, you uh, emotion might be helpful, but we also want to look at your sensation. So, um, we call it in Taiwan, somatization is the very highly technical term, but, uh, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to own my people. So my West Texas, Mexican guys, we do not say, I think I'm sad. Say my head hurts. My neck hurts, man. My, my guy's backache, like, right? That's all. That's all my uncles, right? Um, so, like, um, in my family, there's a what do we call a bimodal distribution in statistics. It means there's a curve, a peak here and a peak later here, um, and it's for lifespan. Women in our families live to their 80s, uh, but men live 50s, and you see it coming or 90s. And you know, if you want to know who's going, which guy's going to be in which bucket, go to a funeral in my family. Okay. And here's why. Because um, like my Uncle Joe, um, my great Uncle Joe turns 98 this year. And um, he'll, he'll be crying. Uh, he'll be composed. Um, he'll be emoting. He's going to be 100. The guys who raised me, my crazy ex-Vietnam uncles, you get two tears as a guy in my family. One at the mass and one at the cemetery. I call them thug tears. I'm like, that's it. And I was seven the first year I remember, and I started crying at the cemetery, and my uncle hits me really hard in the show. And he's like, you man, stop that. I'm like, okay, this is weird. I guess I don't cry. I was just like, I guess this is not what we do. And they're like, yeah. And it's like, well, they seem fine. They're not stressed. They have diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, stroke, uh, like, you know, blood, like everything. They get all the diseases, right? Alcoholism. They like, they, and they just drop like flies. They lose about 40 years. That's why is because they're not processing the stress. And one of the kind of the key things I talk about with people is um, first sensations. That's the first thing we want you to, 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 to cue out is, um, and I often, uh, even those of you who are really in tune with being able to say, I think I'm sad, Mary, I think I'm really frustrated because stress and the pandemic has lowered your abilities uh, to do that. So you might have to start with sensation and I usually do. So like we call it a body scan, start at the top of your head so, uh, Claudia, is there any tension around your head? No, jaw? Yeah, actually, right here. When you wake up, yeah, I think grinding your teeth. Oh, maybe. Yeah. How about your neck? And then see where that is, and then kind of see well, what do you think is good? Then you can go to emotion if you feel comfortable with it. Um, but we start with sensation. That's a really important thing. Um, and so the other thing that the scale is missing is this one, and this is a key thing: personal control. So basically, in the pandemic, your stress should not drop below a five. You might mess up, right? You might not put on your mask correctly. You might not sanitize correctly. You might kind of overestimate. Like, if your stress drops below a five, you might get sick, or you might hurt someone, or you might make a mistake. Or so we, but we actually don't need to mess with your stress. It's this 
scale. Because what Dr. Sapolsky's book shows pretty definitively is it's not high stress that kills you. It's high stress combined with helplessness. Hopelessness kills you. In, in a very literal way, hopelessness does kill you. That's not metaphorical or poetic. Hopelessness kills you. It takes decades off your life. Here's the science version of this. There was a lifetime study done of a couple of thousand people. Um, and they asked them two questions, which creates kind of this X, Y axis. So X axis was how much stress do you think you have? Do you think it's pretty positive, neutral, or pretty negative? And so they followed these people for years. Spoiler alert, they died. Okay, they reviewed the death record. It got dark real fast, sorry. They, they read the death records. 98% um, of us will die at some point in our lives, by the way. Yeah. Not me, but like 98% of us will. And so what they found from um, that kind of four quadrants was this. The people who have the, the highest mortality means they died the soonest. They had, they had the least amount of life were the people in the high stress condition. But only if they had a high negative attribution, they thought stress was very harmful to them. The people who had the lowest mortality, they lived the longest, were the high stress condition with highly positive attribution of stress. They thought stress was their friend. They lived longer than both low stress conditions. So high stress isn't your enemy. It's thinking it's your enemy. Um, and it's also like, but then the question is, well, okay, so, uh, okay, I'll go with you, stress and enemy. So what do I do with it? <laughs> like, what do I, I still got it. And that's the, that's what we're going to talk about. But that's the scientific evidence that it's not the stress that kills you. It's feeling helpless, feeling hopeless. That's what gets you. It doesn't mean not to feel it. It means once you feel it, you got to let it go through your body. Cause that's, cause that's what I want to do. I'm like, well, I, that's what my uncles do. I just won't feel it. <laughs> like that's the, our solution in in the Gomez family tradition. Um, there's we have a men have a deaf solution to emotional and spiritual pain. What we do is we push it deep, deep down, and one day we're dead. And essentially, the problem is resolved at that moment, right? Um, like Jack Daniels is the official sponsor of alcoholism for my family. I think we put more of the Jack Daniels kids through college than any one U.S. family has ever. Uh, we should get like breakaway sweatpants or something like that. You know, just put a lot of the kids. And so, so once you got it, what do you do? How do you act? We call it metabolization. How do I metabolize the stress? How do I keep that helplessness scale from rising? So basically, if I said, so Anne, where's your stress one to 10 in words? Is your not control of the situation, but control of Anne, one to 10. One is low, 10 is max. If Anne says, well, I'm stressed at a nine, but I'm in control of myself at a 10. I don't need to do anything. Can you be highly stressed, but also highly in control of yourself? Yeah, LeBron in a playoff game, Dax in a playoff game, right? That that, that actually that, that actually and also think back to a like a really like good moment. You're like, man, we were in the zone that day. I really I rocked it that day. That was not a low stress day, moderate to high, but your control is at an eleven. Anytime you felt in the zone, well, it can be a personal interaction, professional job is my example. Like you're like, I'm on I'm on the zone today. That's why. Is because your control went up, not your stress went down. Okay, but if Anne is uh, stress is at a four, control is at a three. Now I really got to check in with her, which also implies that things that we don't think of as stressful become stress responses. Like low level stress responses over time can get you. So for us, boredom is a low is a stress response. It's actually pretty toxic being bored. Um, and here's why. Here's our argument. You've never on a Friday said, you know, I get to go home this weekend. I get to get bored. It's going to be great. No one's ever done that, right? <laughs> because boredom is, a, is like secondhand smoke, uh, always in the area. It's a slow, low-level toxin. Um, so then we're like, okay, your, your, your stress is low, but your personal control is probably really low. So how do we up that? How do we amp that? Um, you know, if you're, if you're a, a, like a Mexicana mom, you know, it's like, go outside. <laughs> Yeah, actually, yeah, what science supports that tactic. It's like, do something, go play, go run, like whatever you got to do to get that personal control back up. Not necessarily lowering the stress. Like that, that actually is scientifically accurate, by the way. Um, and so here are some other skills that I want to go over. These, there's kind of two last things. So first one, basically, here's how your brain works. You got an alarm, amygdala. You got a filing center, your hippocampus. These are your memories, and you have your thinking center. Ordinarily, these work together well like, like a band. When you have a stress response, 
it can happen in one, it only needs one shot, but it, the more you have it, like in a pandemic, your alarm takes the wheel. And it's not bad, by the way. If you've ever almost been in a car wreck or have been in a car wreck, this has saved your life. But essentially what happens is um, you are, if you're in this diagram where your thinking center is usually running the ball, this is the quarterback of the brain, you have about infinite number of options. If you're in this mode, you have three and only three, fight, flight, freeze. And this is very hard to tell from a first person perspective. So if Sibali says, and I'm in here, and by the way, um, as an aside, I'll tell kids on that stress scale, here's low stress, here's maximum stress, like one and here's a 10. Um, this is me stressed at a two. Okay, here, I'm gonna show you me stressed at a nine now. Everybody ready? Here's me stressed at a two, here's me stressed at a nine. I don't look any different. <laughs> and so I may not know. So if I'm in that stress response, Sibley may not be able to externally tell. She's like, Michael, how are you doing? I'm fine. Why are you always asking? Fight. Michael, how are you doing? What, just uh, stop bothering me. Flight. Michael, how are you doing? Whatever. Freeze. And if you ever shut down hard with your partner, with your spouse, with your family, that's a freeze response. Those aren't bad, those are just three responses. And so we need a way to reset that back to the original diagram. And, um, the, and these are on your slides, these are, and I, I wrote these down intentionally. So how do we get this back to this? Here's how. We call this T4, four steps. So we want you to notice that alarm, and I'm, I'm actually talking about physical alarm. Are, are, is your head hurting? Are your, fit, are your teeth clenched? Are, is your face red? Is your chest? Sent? then we have a technique called an SOS. And I'm gonna walk everyone through an SOS right now. It's not a relaxation technique. It's a mental focusing technique. It's not meant to reduce stress, but to increase your personal control over yourself. You don't have to participate, but I'm gonna walk you through an SOS right now. I'll show you in real time how fast it is. So S, I want everyone to stop, slow down, take a step back and sweep your mind clear. It'll come back to clutter and that's fine, but for now, just sweep it away for a second. Now, O, orient, focus on the single most important thing to you. To Sibley is Sibley, Anne is Anne, Craig is Craig, Mike is Mike, Claudia is Claudia, Mary, to you. Not to your wife, not to your husband, not to your friend, but to you. Right this second in time. Got it? All right, then do your self-check. So stress, I'm probably like a three. You guys are really fun. You guys are cool. Personal control, about a nine. Okay. This helps you recenter. And even the middle step, okay, so like if, you know, Alice is fighting with, with her husband, like, okay, Alice, what is the most important thing to you right now? To hit him in the mouth. Okay, we would call that reactive. <laughs> we would also call that plan B, okay? And so that is, like my kids will say that. And so reactive versus main, reactive, the definition is, it, reactive is always alarm driven. It's always amygdala driven, those fight, flight, freeze driven. Maine is always thinking center driven. And when I heard this, I thought, well, obviously, I'm gonna skip this, go to this. It, your brain didn't work that way. Here's what, because here's the catch. The phrase we have for Maine, reactive is easy. It's, it's here, fight, flight, or freeze is reactive. Maine is in the pain. And so one of the ways I phrase this when I'm working with parents is, because I'll have a lot of parents, like usually the dad, like do that thing where they're so, freaking angry they over enunciate every word because i want him out right <laughs> and so that's an alarm response that's the anger fight and so i tell parents you know we don't get upset about things we don't care about right like so it must mean you care about your boy a lot because if you didn't you wouldn't care and i've worked with those parents we call that neglect yeah you can do what he wants Claudia. i don't care Really? Like, he got arrested. Yeah, happens. We all get arrested. Really? Like, and so, yeah. So that's essentially what um, we're, we're looking at is, you know, we want to get them like, we want to see why do they care so much? Why is this so upsetting to them? So if you are just firing off at people the whole time, um, then uh, um, so, um, if you're doing that, then um, 
you want to see, well, why, why is that? Um, and so, you know, what's going on here? And so you got to turn towards that pain. That's the catch is like, whatever is stressing you out is probably really important. So like, why are you so freaked out right in this moment about the pandemic? I mean, it's been going on since March and what right now you're just bummed. Well, you know, maybe your, your mom has a doctor's appointment. Uh, maybe you'll, you know, have to go outside and you haven't gone outside in three months. Like, and then you're like, well, I won't be able to see my grandkids. Yeah, it means you probably love them a great deal, don't you? Right, so we can turn towards that love. Um, what it actually asked, got asked this by a, a kid and also by a therapist. They're like, well, where does religion, spirituality fit in that? And I say, religion is usually main, like your spiritual kind of connection is usually main. And I have one kid, he's like, can I pray to get back to main? Yeah, yeah, you can. If, if that's your thing, is it like, I'm not going to tell you to do that, but if that's your thing, then yes. He's like, it is. I'm like, great. And that's what he does. Orienting thoughts. He uses Bible verses, right? You know, yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death. I like orienting, perfect meets it. Like, you know, uh, Christ's love is infinite. Christ is in me. Christ is important to me. Great. That's main. Perfect. That, and I'm, I'm not being sarcastic at all. That I'm like, yes, use that. A lot of our kids don't have access to that or don't, that's not their kind of way that they go. And that's okay. We can, we can do it secularly, but, you know, uh, your spiritual connection is vastly powerful to get you to main. Um, it's something that can reset that alarm really quickly. Um, I, I have uh, one of my friends, he's a divinity uh, professor, and he says, you know, um, um, he's like, spirituality isn't about fixing problems, it's about learning to tolerate some of these problems, like learning to be able to, to sit with that distress about things you can do nothing about. He's like, we should try to fix, he, and he actually gives a similar advice, we should try to fix them if possible. If people are getting hurt, there's injustice, we should try to fix them. But there's some things that like we may not be able to or like you as an individual can so then we like how do we live with that and he's like it's it's a it's a ancient and powerful toolkit to be able to do that and that's a that's an ancient thing right the people in dealing with things they can't control or predict for millennia and he's like so because he was talking as a divinity person i was talking as a therapist about this and i'm like yeah that actually fits really well uh, i think that's a that's a really you know accurate paradigm for that now one of the things I want to talk about is um, some people will ask me, well, what are some exact skills I can do? So I get this idea, but what's something like, if I'm having a panic attack, what can I do? Things like that. And I want to kind of finish on that. So we would call that parasympathetic recovery, the calmer we talked about. And basically, this is in your slides too. This is your diagram. So if you are having high anxiety or high anger, we call this diaphragmatic breathing. I'll take you through, through a set of diaphragmatic breathing. Okay, ready? We're gonna do two rounds of it, okay? So I want everyone to breathe in. Hold it for one, two, three, and breathe out. Okay, now one more round. Breathe in, hold it, and breathe out. If you type in diaphragmatic breathing script, um, then you'll get like literally a thousand hits. Um, and so it'll, um, it, there's, there are tons out there. Um, and so that one is really good for high anxiety. If you get, if you're getting a headache, that'll usually, cause you usually have some tension. that will be helpful for that. Not all, like it won't cure it. Um, the most important thing is your out breath has to be longer than whatever in breath you did. So if you breathe in for two, breathe out for at least three. If you breathe in for five, breathe out for at least six. Here's the reason why. The, the way this techniques work is your, your nervous system has two highways, sympathetic, parasympathetic. These are technical terms, not like sympathetic, like, oh, nervous system, it's technical. Okay, I'm gonna show you sympathetic nervous system. Ready? That's a gas pedal. Here's parasympathetic. That's a brake pedal. You need more brake than gas if you're panicking or you're about to punch a hole in the wall. Yeah, that's the reason why. And so it doesn't matter how long. You can breathe in two, out four. Breathe in three, out five. Breathe in three, out four. Breathe, as long as that out breath is slightly longer. Okay. Now, PMR, that, that somatization I told you about, um, that's what it works really well on. It also works on the West Texas Mexicano. Uh, these are all my cousins, by the way, because here's what they look like. Like, yo, Claudia, I'm, I'm calm. I'm calm, man. I'm calm, man. Yo, Alice, I'm calm. You know, my neck hurts. I'm like, blame my McDonald's thing. I know why your neck hurts. I know why. It's like, no, man, I'm calm. This is me calm, man. 
I'm calm, right? Like they're so tense, right? So this is, uh, now I'll show you a, a kid version of one, okay? Uh, we use it with some of our elementary kids, so we'll call it the turtle. So I want the turtle to go in his shell. Now he's gonna come up. He's gonna look around. Okay, now he's gonna go back in his shell. And now he's gonna come up, right? Or the stretch like the, the airplane stretch. And back. Stretch. And back. Okay. The third class, the fourth one is naturally relaxing, like getting yourself in something you do day to day, like gardening or like, um, actually this kid I was talking about, he's like, oh, I read scripture morning and evening. Great. That, that's for you. That's awesome. Uh, one of my kids likes tea. Um, so she'll take the decaffeinated one. I'm like, great. That's fine. Um, and whatever it is. Now, the other one we call grounding or mindfulness. If you have high sadness or you're kind of spacing out, if you're like, Mary, Mary, yeah, you okay? Mm -hmm. Now you're kind of not there, you're not focused. Uh, SOS is an example of a mindfulness technique. Uh, if you're having this really intensely, like I'm, I'm like losing time, dude, we will do grounding. And so I'll give you an example of, of uh, a very simple grounding technique. So we call it the ABC game. Baltimore, Chicago. Georgia, Jacksonville, something like that. Another one is five, four, three, two, one. So five things you see. One, two, three, four. Four things you feel on your body. Three things you, and then you just go down your senses. Three things you smell, two things you hear, things like that. Um, and that's something that can get you back to center. Um, now, the last thing I wanted to go over was, um, or tonight, was, um, here we go. Okay, yeah, I think you can see that. We call it accountability. Now, you, actually, some of you have your accountability partner with you. This is a person who can check in with you and kind of call you out. Another one is a digital accountability partner. So the COVID coach, you can download that on your phone. It gives you setting a goal tracking your well-being, tracking your anxiety, tracking your mood. It'll give you the diaphragmatic breathing tools, mindfulness tools, progressive muscle relaxation tools. Uh, this is a screenshot of it, and it, it's really good. The, the National Center on PTSD created this for the pandemic. If you have an iPad, you have a smartphone, you have a laptop, you can download this. Now, here's the last thing I want to show you. These were my scores during the pandemic. This is the last thing, the second to last thing I want to go over. Y'all think I'm gonna make it, okay. Uh, I was like, we're gonna make it. So um, March, um, nine, March 17th um, was the first day we got our first two COVID-19 patients confirmed at University Medical Center here in London. March 17th is also probably the last in-person lecture at Texas Tech Health Sciences Center. I did it uh, for residents and medical students. Um, so not the 17th, not the 18th, not the 19th, but the 19th, I finally transferred all of my people to work from home. And, but as some of those of you who've been to UMC and to Health Sciences Center know, it's a shared building. It's one building, really, right? <laughs> it's shared space. So I'm like, I, I didn't know they, the coronavirus people were there until I went home. I was like, right? And so I was like, I, so I didn't have anything, right? So not 17th, 19th, but 19th, two days later, my chest is hurting. I'm having trouble breathing. I'm like, crap, I got killed my mom, killed my girlfriend, killed everybody, killed my student, killed everyone's dead. Everyone's dead because me. <laughs> That's what, now it wasn't here. It was here, my alarm. And um, there's an app called Heart Rate Free, which it'll turn on your flashlight. You put your finger to it. It'll take your pulse in real time. My pulse hovers in the low 70s, all things being equal. At the moment I took it, and this was a whole day, by the way. It's evening. This has happened since morning, since I woke up. My heart rate was 118 and rising. I was having a mild panic attack. And I used to get them a lot in high school, but I hadn't had one in years. So I'm like, you know, hello, darkness, my old friend. Right? And so, so I had to dust off the skills. Diaphragmatic breathing brought myself down. And I was like, I had a panic attack. Huh. I told, next day was supervision with my entire team. And I told them this. I said, your fearless leader had a panic attack. I think you get two panic attacks per week of pandemic. Everyone cool with that? We all good with that? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I was on a national uh, child traumatic stress network call and one of the uh, Duke 
people, people from Duke University, we were talking about working from home. And she corrected us. She said, you are not working from home. We're like, what do you mean? Here's what you're doing. You're in the middle of an unprecedented event in history that we will hopefully never see again in our lifetime. You're also working from home. You're also parenting. You're also trying to be a spouse. That's the periphery. That's not what you're doing. This is the centrality. And so I think per week of pandemic, two panic attacks. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Again, just you have, just you do have to suck a little less every day. And you don't have to be healthy. Just healthier. There's no healthy you. Okay? And so it, that's it. That's all you got to do is just a little bit every day. You're going to like, I did boxing here when I was growing up in West Texas. And my coach would say, if you're in the ring and you're not getting hit, you're not boxing. I do not know what you are doing, but it's not boxing. Okay. So if you felt those punches since March, it means you were boxing. Good. You're a fighter. And that's kind of what we're teaching. West Texans are great fighters, by the way. <laughs> like this is one thing we do well. That's what we do. Last thing I want to do is I want to give you kind of the, the most powerful tool. So all the stuff I talked about, let's say, you know, I try that, doesn't work. I'm going to give you your most powerful tool. Okay. Everybody ready for it. This is your most powerful tool in the pandemic, far and away, besides everything I've said tonight. Ready for it? Ready? Here it is. Like 20 seconds was killing most of you, right? Yeah, that's it. You don't know what to do when you're like, oh. all right. So, Claudia, take a second. We're just going to sit here. We don't have to say anything. Okay. That's it. You don't have to do anything. Just sit, take the silence, take the breath, just be. It's all you have to do. You, you made it to August, September, right? You did it. You're here. And you'll make it. You'll be okay. Right? It's going to be awful. It's going to suck. And it has sucked. But you got here. Right? Again, people, we're, talk, we're looking at people in 1918 <laughs> during that pandemic, seeing like, what was it like? For, and it's like, yeah. And it's like, yeah, because the, the, the in, implicit in that is like, they, they did it, man. They were taking the hits and they were there. So you can take a moment just to breathe, just to take a break, just to be silent. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. Silence helps with the connection. I can't fix it, so let me connect. I don't have to say anything. I can sit next to Anne, like, sucks, huh? Yeah, no. That's all. That's all I may need. That's all Anne may need. There's something beautiful about sitting in silence with a person you feel connected to and just being able to be for a moment or two. Like, I know there's awfulness out there. Right now, we can just be. So, it allows you to, to extend the probably the most important thing, which is compassion for to you. Okay. You're good at extending it to the person right next to you, by the way. Probably really bad, like me, extending it in the other direction. And the silence really helps with that. So, um, last but certainly not least, uh, your zombie killing name. So, Anne is King Knight. Ooh, good one. Okay. So, Mary, you are the Mad Knight. Okay, Claudia? Is King, ooh, King Knight. Claudia might win, by the way, King Knight. So that, that's a good one, Claudia, yeah. So my girl, you're the Mad Knight. The Mad Knight, ooh, that's a good one too. So I think you have the same one. So I have been the Mad Double Tap. Thank you all very much. I know we're past the hour, so uh, feel free to jump off if you need to. But if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to stick around for a minute or two. So thank you all very much for this, by the way. I appreciate the opportunity to check in with you. So thank you. All right, so I believe back to you. Thank you so much for this. Uh, are there any questions? Does anybody have any, any thoughts or comments or questions for Dr. Gomez? So I think I tried to make the slides detailed enough where you could just like get them and just read through them if you needed to. Um, also your zombie killing name is in those slides. It's my understanding. So if you're like, I didn't catch my name, then just feel free to go in there and find your name, Alice. Uh, so, so I want to know who I am. So yeah, that's fine. Dr. Gomez. Yes. How yes, um, using these techniques that you that you talked to us about? I think a lot of us, and, and I maybe shouldn't generalize, but hmm. it. I think a lot of it now is how long this has 
gone on. It's kind yeah. of like, you know, okay, I was, I was okay, and I, I've yeah. been dealing with it, but how do you deal with not knowing how much longer you have to deal with it? Yeah, well, actually, that's a good question. And it's like, that's why, again, going back to fixing versus connecting is uh, that people have asked me that question directly. And it's like, so is this anything we can fix? And one of the things I, I especially my students have asked me that a lot. And I say, um, there's a, there's a phrase in philosophy to, uh, for ethics called ought implies can. Uh, if I say like you ought to drive this plate speed limit, it implies you can. If I say you ought to do an advanced calculus differential equation, it implies you can. But Maybe you can. That's actually the question under discussion. So, um, like, so uh, you go from well, what can I do? I, I know as a fact I don't know when it's going to end. So, what can I do? And we've had some interesting uh, kind of uh, outcome of that. So, I, some of you may have seen articles like in like online, like one like I've seen this title more than once. By the way, PTSD is my superpower. Uh, and it's like whoa, it's uh, like and it's people like I I've had PTSD since like ten and I'm thirty. It won't end. It probably won't. Or I've had depression since 15 and I'm 55. It's not in me. It will never end. But can I still have a good life? Can I still have goals and dreams? Yeah, they may look different than people who aren't depressed, but they're no less important. So can I, what, if there are things I can fix, and actually some, for some people that's really powerful, I'm going to finally uh, plant that garden. Right. That, and that's not trivial, by the way. It's like, no, that's actually critical because we need something we can, that again comes to your question, we need something we can fix that we can do. Uh, that's how human brains are wired. But like now for the other stuff, what are the connections I can make? Uh, and how they're gonna look different. So how uh, how am I gonna, you know, kind of process those, the differences in that when I can't necessarily give this person a hug and I really like giving people a hug. Um, and so um, so the, the, also the last thing I wanna say to that question is um, the techniques, I, we use them, especially at the front end. What, here's a pattern I've seen, people who were a wreck in March and April, are doing really well now with these techniques because they've been practicing them. They just got more practice time. The people who are like, I think I'm okay. They're actually doing, and, and they're kind of, they kind of feel guilty when they talk to me. They're like, Man, I didn't get exposed. No one died. And they feel almost guilty for bringing it up that they are not doing well. And I say, no, again, that's the first thing I said, just say it. I'm not doing well. Great. It doesn't, you don't have to be like suicidal. You're just like, I'm not sleeping, man. I just feel edgy all the time. Thank you for saying that because these same tools will apply to that. It, it's actually just putting them online for when you have those and practicing them. And I tell people, you're going to be really bad at that. You're not going to be good at this. So give it two weeks, you know, and just, or even just pick a tool, pick, do the COVID coach and just use that for two weeks. That's it. And so just try one thing I talked about, just do T4, done. You don't have to do anything else. Uh, through a bunch of stuff, do the breathing. Do that every day, but when you wake up, do that before you go to sleep. Do that when you feel your, your head start dancing up. Just, just pick one tool. You don't have to do a bunch of them. Uh, and then you can add another tool, and you can add another tool. Uh, but um, I'm glad you brought that up because I've had that a lot more recently. And they're like, I was fine. March, April, May, June, it hit me. I've been a wreck since June, but nothing, nothing happened. And I have to say, you are in an apocalypse. That happened. <laughs> like, like, it doesn't matter if you're in The Walking Dead and you're like, oh, I'm not in a house. Like, you're still in an apocalypse. And, like, I think people feel guilty about that. And I, in our world, in mine and Anne's world, we call that survivor guilt. It's actually a variation of that. Well, I'm lucky because no one I know has died of COVID 19 yet. And then sometimes I'll call people out, yet. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, it's still, it's always there. The yet yeah is the problem, yet. Yeah. I don't know when it's going to end. I don't know. And that's a legitimate thing. These tools can apply for that. But if we are thinking we're going to fix it, we're going to get healthy again, it, they become frustrating. It's like, well, we're going to, we're going to be able to use them to kind of, you know, not lower the stress, but increase, you know, feeling in control to, to decrease hopelessness is what they're for. Not to increase health, but to decrease hopelessness. Uh, which again, going back to like what I said earlier, if, if you identify as like religious, spiritual, like, you know, Know, Christian, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, whatever, you have such a powerful tool set there. I've also noticed people who bring that online uh, tend to metabolize faster and more efficient. I'm not saying that it's, it's better or worse to be that type of person, just from a functional perspective, you got, you're just metabolizing much quicker, more efficiently, and more consistently. Uh, my suspicion is because you just have more practice at doing that. Um, um, you're just like, you know, well, I pray the rosary every, every weekend, right? That, that's a practice. That's a metabolization practice. 
So, um, and so, um, yeah, and it like, and talking to her mom, that's another, you know, good tad that those conversations are also just really helpful as well. So did I actually answer the question or did I kind of walk all the way around the question? <laughs> Okay, cool. So, um, any other questions? Awesome. So, and if if you have any questions, feel free to email Sibley, and she, you can send them directly. Actually, and I think also have my email. Uh, so you can always get a hold of me there. Um, but again, this is you know part of, part of my I consider part of my job, which is uh, when people are. Uh, I'm usually the person people call when they have no one else to call. They're like, I don't know, who to call your dog, and like, and, and they're freaking out because they feel guilty talking to their family. They're feel, and I'm like, yeah, this is a legitimate thing. This is what I do most of my day. So. Um, so if you, if you need anything, just feel free to let me know. Um, I think the slides are publicly available now. So I uh, really appreciate everybody's time tonight. I know, I know it's kind of a late day for you all. So thank you. And I will, I will email out the slides. So that everybody who attended has them. Thank you so much, Dr. Gomez. Uh, I, you. You know, I, I learned quite a few things that really helped me. So, uh, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. So uh, you'll have a good, oh, thank you, Anne, got the heart. So thank you all, everybody. Uh, take care over there. And um, if you need anything, I'm always available. So uh, my email's on, on the slides as well. So take care and uh, be safe out there. And it was wonderful talking with her. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much.